Hello and uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Stephen Ingledew. I'm the Chief Executive of FinTech Scotland. Welcome to this uh, webinar, um, which uh, is hosted with Invest uh, Hong Kong, Scottish Development International. And we have a really terrific uh, set of sort of people really to share some insights about the real growing opportunities that are emerging in Hong Kong for FinTech entrepreneurs and enterprises to really take their opportunities forward on the global stage with their innovations. Um, I'm your host, I'm your panel uh, host really for this morning. And um, it really is a great, I know because we've got people joining us uh, from Scotland, from the UK, I know from Europe as well, as well as some great top friends, of course, in Hong Kong and in the Far East. So a very international audience. This is part of also Scotland's FinTech Festival month. Uh, this is week four. Uh, and so it's great once again to have a, an international participation, especially from Hong Kong in the festival activities, which is 85 events over a four week period. Anyway, without further ado, um, I'd like to first of all, welcome up uh, Andrew from Invest Hong Kong, where he's just gonna say a few words uh, before passing on to Cherise of Scottish Development International, Andrew. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Uh, it's great for Invest Hong Kong to be hosting this webinar today with our friends from FinTech Scotland and Scottish Development International. In my 10 years with Invest Hong Kong, uh, both in Hong Kong and more recently the UK, I've been lucky enough to work with a number of interesting and successful Scottish companies who that have made Hong Kong their home in Asia. This has ranged from retail to creative to engineering, and now hopefully fintech as well. Now, the, the reason why fintechs should set up in Hong Kong instead of um, going elsewhere, it's the opportunity to build relationships with the established players. There are over 160 banks, licensed banks in Hong Kong, including eight virtual banks and over 400 hedge funds, you know, managing $91 billion in assets. You know, it is a global financial center after um, New York and London. And it's a huge proportion of GDP is in finance. So it's an obvious location for fintechs to come. Um, it's got a very progressive regulatory and policy environment. And you know, that is something that makes it easier for fintech companies to come into the market. Of course, there is the talent, and you'll hear more about that from some of our speakers today. And you know, uh, it ranks in the Global Financial uh, Services Index right up there. Um, the think tank uh, ZY um, consistently ranks Hong Kong as one of the top global financial centers in the world. And of course, there is opportunity beyond Hong Kong in both the Greater Bay Area, which I'm sure you'll hear more about today, as well as other parts of Asia and the mainland. And let's not forget, we've got a great event coming up in a couple of weeks time in the Hong Kong FinTech Week. So thank you very much to all of the participants who have joined us today, as well as a great panel of speakers. And so over to you, Sharice. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today. With the spike in the number of COVID-19 cases and new rounds of restrictions being enforced, I hope everyone is keeping well. A quick introduction. I'm Sharice Mascarenas, and I lead our science and technology trade operations for Scottish Development International in Asia Pacific. I'm joined by my colleagues, Simon Shen and Lorraine Mallon, who have been instrumental in organizing today's webinar with Invest Hong Kong and FinTech Scotland. Who are we and what do we do? Scottish Development International is the international economic development arm of the Scottish government, responsible for promoting bilateral trade and investment between <laughs> Scotland and global markets. We have over 30 global offices, and our Hong Kong office is just one of them. Stephen, 
mention the Scotland FinTech Festival, which is currently underway. I'm delighted that today's session is part, is an international track of the Scotland FinTech Festival. And it's also a good precursor to the Hong Kong FinTech Week, which is scheduled in a couple of weeks. In line with Scottish Government's a Trading Nation report, we've identified FinTech as a priority subsector, which we're keen to pursue, particularly in the Hong Kong market. From a trade perspective, our mandate is to support Scottish companies internationalize. So this can stretch right from providing advice on the market opportunities, the ecosystem, the regulatory landscape, through to facilitating introductions with partners. I'm truly grateful to Stephen, Andrew and Keith from Invest Hong Kong and FinTech Scotland, who have been key and very supportive in organizing today's session. Success and partnership, I think, is critical for us to succeed globally. And it's important that all of us are working coherently and co collaboratively. I'm also grateful to our panelists, William Berkshire, Bertrand Theo, and Brian Tang, who have taken time out of their busy schedule to actually join us today and share their insights. Thank you very much, everyone. So I hope from today's webinar, we will be sharing a glimpse of the fintech ecosystem and the market opportunities that Hong Kong presents. We're there to support. So I really hope each of you will follow up and will reach out to us. I'll now hand over to Stephen Ingledew, who will facilitate today's discussion. Thank, thank you, you Stephen. Thank you, Sharice, and thank you, Andrew. And uh, can I just ask those uh, not on the panel, can you go on mute, please? Can you go on mute? Thank you. Um, so the idea, the objective of this panel really is so to provide some real insights about the fintech opportunities and hear from those really at the forefront of actually doing it right now. So I'm delighted that uh, we have a panel made up of um, Will from FNZ, one of the world's most successful fintech enterprises that uh, I've known now for nearly 15 years, but very much on the global stage that uh, have a headquartered in Scotland, but very much now that presence in Hong Kong and in Asia. Also Bertrand from Statteris, who very much at the founding end, a seasoned entrepreneur, but, seasoned, uh, but uh, an enterprise which is developing in the payment space. And also delighted to have Brian with us from the Hong Kong FinTech Association with a particular focus around regulation. You're gonna hear from each of those and then we're going to hopefully receive some questions from you of the key things on your mind of the opportunities to develop your innovations and enterprises in Hong Kong and the region. So without further adieu, um, I believe that we're going to start with uh, Bertrand uh, with a presentation on um, his enterprise and how he's really looking to develop those opportunities in Hong Kong and the region. Thank you, Bertrand. Hi, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. So uh, we have prepared a few, a few slides to introduce what is Tatris. Can we see the first slide, please? Uh, okay, so Statris, um, next. Um, so who we are, so we are in a, a fintech company. Uh, we, the company was set up in Hong Kong like a bit more than two years ago. Uh, it took us some time to uh, basically assemble the pieces of the puzzle that we needed in order to be in business. And so we uh, went live uh, this year in January. So not exactly the best momentum because uh, that was immediately followed by the um, Chinese New Year, which obviously didn't come as a surprise because that was on the agenda. But then it was followed by the uh, COVID-19, which um, we didn't really, uh, I mean, nobody uh, really expected. So that may be something that we will discuss uh, later. Uh, at the moment, we have 20 employees. Uh, these employees are shared between two offices. Obviously, most, are, are, most of the staff is in uh, Hong Kong, where we have uh, the core of our operation and we also have an office in uh, in Bangkok uh, we I mean that was the subject of many discussion when we started the, um, this project uh, but we decided to um, develop our own uh, proprietary uh, digital platform um, and that it's uh, a payment and FX uh, platform uh, so it took us some time to develop it but I think that was the the right choice to do 
And then uh, in order to be in business, we also, of course, um, being in the payment industry, we need to have some uh, licenses. And so we have the uh, money service operator license in Hong Kong, which I will qualify more or less, although there are some differences as a kind of a payment license in Hong Kong. And we also have the uh, SPI license in the UK. Um, next. So what we do, um, as mentioned before, we have developed a payment and FX platform uh, for Asian SMEs. We deal only with corporate, no uh, individual uh, clients. And why have we decided to set up this uh, business? Because uh, for those who are not very familiar about Hong Kong, there are more than 150,000 companies set up in Hong Kong every year. It can be even more than that. Um, and so obviously all these companies, they need access to uh, some banking services and it's getting more and more difficult for, for them to have access to this, uh, to this solution. So initially, we also had the question whether we will set up our business in Hong Kong or in Singapore. Uh, actually, it was a no brainer to go to Hong Kong after we check at the size of the market because there are twice, uh, yeah, twi two times more companies set up in Hong Kong than in Singapore. Um, then next. Uh, and so what we want to do, we want to serve what we call the abundant client. Uh, as I've just mentioned, it's more and more difficult for companies set up in Hong Kong to uh, find a bank that will, a traditional bank that is interested in uh, opening a bank account for, to serve their business. Two main reasons for that. Uh, when we speak about small, uh, I mean, small companies or young companies, uh, typically the bank don't really know what their business will be. And so they don't really know what the kind of revenue they will generate with opening an account for these companies. Um, so that's the first obstacle. Number two is the uh, compliance, uh, compliance issues. Um, a lot of the companies that are set up in Hong Kong are actually managed and owned by people who don't necessarily live in Hong Kong and maybe you know, everywhere in the world because that's the, that's the, the magic of Hong Kong where you have, uh, it's really the uh, financial hub and the trade hub for, you know, for Asia. And so a lot of companies, especially in trading, you know, they, have, uh, they buy from China or some other countries in Southeast Asia to sell everywhere in the world. And so their managers and charters are not necessarily sitting in Hong Kong. Uh, the combination of these two factors, uh, their size and also possible compliance issues, and make it difficult for a lot of them to have access to a, a business account in Hong Kong. And this is what we want to offer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our expansion plan. So uh, as I say, we uh, launched the business uh, nine months ago. So it was now phase one. So at that time, we uh, provided our client with uh, access to a, on, well, a business account okay, in Hong Kong, multi-currency. That client can use to do domestic and international payment, and also uh, we have developed some uh, nice uh, FX capabilities, facilities on, the, on our platform, especially FX spot and forward. Now we are entering the phase two. Uh, we have actually partnered with a UK fintech called Rails Bank to offer our client local currency account in the EU. Um, that's live for this has been live for the last two weeks. UK will be coming next week. Uh, next month, sorry, and soon in the US. Uh, we have also agreement signed with MasterCard to offer a debit card, an agreement signed with Xero for an uh, integration with an accounting for accounting, uh, accounting software uh, and trade financing. And then the phase three uh, will be to grow out of Hong Kong to Southeast Asia. Um, that's also something that we may discuss further because we see uh, potentially a big market there and we want to go in, uh, in countries like Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. And that's also one of the reasons why we already have set up this office in, uh, in Bangkok. So that's it about status, um, you know, for a quick presentation about what, the, what is the company and what we are doing. Thank you, Bertrand. That's really insightful. I'm particularly interested about, obviously, how you've that early sort of stage with how you've been made, really establishing yourself in Hong Kong in a very short period of time. But obviously, you're seeing it also as a base for the Far East and broader. And maybe that's a point we'll come back to, though that opportunity of expansion is not just the Hong Kong, it's the broader opportunities for your sure. uh, innovative enterprise. So uh, maybe we'll come back to that maybe under the, the panel. So I'd like now to move on to our 
Our second example about really, um, and a fintech that really has sort of captured so many people's imagination about how to develop a very successful enterprise over a, a number of years called FNZ. Um, and for that, really, I'd like to hand over to Will Berkshire. Will. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen. And thank you, um, firstly, to uh, Scottish Development um, and Invest Hong Kong uh, for asking me to speak um, today. Uh, and of course, good morning to everyone um, in Scotland and from the UK, uh, from us here in, in Hong Kong. Um, if we could just move to the next slide, please. Um, and, and the next, actually. Um, just by way of, of introduction, as um, you might see from the name, originally the company was established out of New Zealand, um, now headquartered um, out of Scotland, um, 15 plus um, years um, of, of growth, um, around about 3,000 employees, um, a large majority of whom are uh, technology specialists. Um, we have um, 700 billion plus uh, US dollars um, under admin, um, on our platform, um, serving um, end investors of our clients um, around about 8 million plus. Um, and our customers who are regulated financial institutions, um, um, we have around about 100 plus of those and, and that continues to grow um, very rapidly. In terms of our ownership, we are privately held um, um, by a large number of staff, um, as well as uh, long-term investors um, who include um, relevance to us here in Asia, uh, Temasek, um, which is, of course, a government um, of Singapore uh, wealth fund. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. Um, rather a lot of information on this slide, um, but just to briefly explain um, what we do. Um, we're very much... Um, more than just a, a software provider. Um, our model uh, really, as you can see on the left-hand uh, column, is to provide um, platform as a service in wealth management. Um, we see this um, platform as a service model um, increasingly becoming popular um, and also graining traction held here in Asia as institutions um, very much uh, recalibrate their operating models and focus you know, on the important parts where they add value in terms of that um, client service proposition, innovation and, and uh, product creation. Um, this model provides a number of benefits, um, not only in terms of cost, uh, you will have seen um, from the 700 billion uh, US dollar figure on our system, uh, we are able to uh, provide um, access uh, to uh, that scale, um, as well as our ongoing um, R&D spending and service improvements. Um, our model also enables um, our clients, uh, regulated financial institutions globally, um, to transfer the management of operational <coughs> risk to us, uh, as well as driving um, automation and, and cover. Um, our um, operating model, our commercial model also, which is where we charge uh, a percentage on the assets under administration on our platform, also al aligns us um, with our customers. So we grow and prosper together um, or, or die as the case may be. So very much alignment. We see that as um, a key part of building a long-term partnership. Um, and lastly, um, as I mentioned, um, a key thing is that the client obviously maintains uh, full ownership um, of that proposition um, and engagement um, with the customer. So uh, next, please. Um, as I've alluded to, we are a, a global player. Um, we partner with major financial institutions um, in the UK, Europe, um, Australasia, um, China in Hong Kong and Shanghai, um, as well as Singapore. Um, in Shanghai, we have, um, for uh, around about six years now, um, a world-class uh, development center with over 130 staff, um, growing to 200 plus um, in the next um, 18 months. Um, next, please. Um, as I mentioned, um, you can see from the logos, logos here, um, our customers are um, pretty sizable, well-known um, financial institutions. Um, across the banking, asset and wealth management um, and insurance uh, spaces across um, most geographies uh, globally. Uh, next, please. Um, and lastly, um, as I mentioned, as a global provider, we really seek to combine um, that market leading technology um, with that um, asset servicing. So as I said, not just software, 
um, to allow our customers to focus on providing that first class uh, digital service um, and engagement. Um, and in particular, um, we enable them to create um, scalable and very personalized solutions, um, what's increasingly known as hyper-personalization, um, where uh, advisors are really able to drill down and focus on goals of customers um, rather than having um, one size fits all. So that we see as a, a very important part of our service and one which is going to become um, increasingly important to be successful in the wealth space. Um, secondly, we also enable wealth managers to really focus on um, differentiating their proposition to clients um, and outsourcing some of the commoditized areas, the processing, um, the cost areas of their business um, to a third party, a proven third party such as ourselves. Um, we also um, help our clients adopt to market innovations and regulatory changes globally. Um, so talking to a number of players here and um, in, in, in China and elsewhere in Asia, um, this really helps them expand globally and be compliant with regulatory uh, changes uh, and to do that with um, a, a level of confidence. Um, and lastly, um, we also reduce, um, based on our scale, um, cost and complexity um, to our customers, again, the regulated financial institutions. Um, so just to um, just to close off on our intro, um, as I mentioned, um, we are uh, one of the leading um, Scottish headquartered uh, fintech um, uh, companies in China, if not the, the, uh, the, the largest, um, and also one of the largest players um, in the wealth management industry, which is um, uh, the, the growth is basically unmatched. Um, um, in, in Asia compared to, to elsewhere. So uh, very much uh, delighted to be here and to be asked to be here today uh, to share some experiences um, and views on um, you know, developments out here, how to engage with the, uh, with the market as well as uh, some opportunities in the wealth space in particular. So uh, Stephen, thanks very much and over to you. Thank you, Will, and thank you for sharing your insights. I mean, uh, it's terrific to hear about the, the whole wealth management opportunity in Hong Kong and in the Far East and the way that FNZ have uh, really sort of taken a hold and pioneered in many respects. Obviously, there's always a lot of talk around banking and payments, but wealth management really is a fast growing area for fintech enterprises. And I know there's interest from Scotland in the opportunities in the Far East, such as Hong Kong. So thank you. We'll come back to some of your experiences in a moment, Will. So, um, our third panelist is uh, Brian from uh, the Hong Kong uh, Fintech Association, who's got a terrific sort of background experience, particularly, Brian, because you see fintechs from all aspects in terms of how they're successfully developing in Hong Kong, particularly in the space of regulation and sometimes referred to as reg tech. So, Brian, over to you for your perspective. Great. Thank you so very much. If you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, uh, so, so my name is Brian Tang. Um, I came more from the, the finance and legal background. Um, I came to Hong Kong from New York to join Credit Suisse and then left there to go into fintech and regtech. Now, in, in some ways, um, you know, Hong Kong is a cap global capital market, right? And that's what brought me there doing IPOs and the like. But um, what drew me into the regtech space was really regtech. I see regtech as the, the secret source. So you've heard this this afternoon slash this morning from on payments uh, and 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 uh, from Bertrand and on on wealth tech as they call it from from Will, but you know whether if you're a traditional financial institution, be it a bank, an insurance company, or a securities company, a private bank, whether you're a virtual bank or neo bank or challenger bank as you would call it there, um, a an insure tech, um, a, a digital asset firm. All of you, you need reg tech to actually allow to work digitally, so hence the secret source. So as the co-chair of the reg tech committee of the FinTech Association, we've organized what we call reg tech live events, where we've promoted um, KYC and AML solutions, um, as well as AI and, and, and machine learning kind of solutions as well. Um, uh, in the last few years, we've also created the what I call the APEC reg tech network. So it's Hong Kong very much playing to the gateway uh, thesis uh, we're working together with the Singapore FinTech Association, the Mal Japan one, as well as the Malaysian one, so that all the reg tech um, solution providers um, can, can connect and better be acquainted. So, so as, as was heard earlier on, um, Hong Kong is net net a, 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 a capital market and so therefore an importer of, of reg tech. And so what we've been doing in the last few years 
uh, including working with Invest Hong Kong, is really outreaching to the wonderful solutions from around the world. Um, and last year, as part of our World Reg Tech Summit, uh, as, as part of the FinTech Week, um, uh, we organized World Reg Tech Summit, where we invited um, we had two leading panelists, uh, including um, authors of the Reg Tech book, which, which originated, frankly, from Hong Kong. We had 16 Reg Techs from around the world and 180 registrants um, sign up. Now, for those that understand regulation and reg tech, it's so important to actually have the regulatory buy-in. Um, and so, um, and that is something that certainly has happened here in Hong Kong. Um, so the HKMA, uh, which governs the, the banking industry, is very supportive. And last year, we participated uh, with them in their AML CFT reg tech forum, where uh, they asked us to introduce them reg techs to, to their 200 plus um, uh, authorized institutions, which are registered by the HKMA. This year, the, the HKMA has also engaged KPMG to launch a survey and a white paper to really improve reg tech adoption. So really it's a wonderful opportunity where the regulators are encouraging reg tech's uh, adoption in Hong Kong. Um, and so uh, we most welcome uh, Scottish um, reg techs. This year, um, as part of this year's um, uh, online uh, FinTech week, we're again doing our RegTech uh, Summit. Again, last year we had wonderful uh, support from, um, from uh, a lot of uh, players, including Ireland and, and, um, and Australia, which have a lot of RegTechs. I, I heard from Stephen that there are lots of wonderful RegTechs coming out of Scotland, and we look forward to, to having a nice contingent from Scotland appearing with us uh, virtually. So you get to save on the airfare plus uh, reduce your carbon footprint, but still have your presence in Hong Kong. And this year, what, one of the things we'll be doing is, is actually launching a, a RegTech ecosystem map of Hong Kong and beyond, as well as a, 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 the, the first of our series of RegTech anatomies, uh, initially focused on identity. So um, RegTech in itself is complicated. It, it's like FinTech, there are so many segments to it. Um, the first segment we're focusing is, is online KYC and background checks. If you are a FinTech of any sort, you need to onboard clients. And, and in this day of COVID, um, as you all would know, everybody's now online um, and, and as, as more and more, there's more and more adoption, um, the ability to do facial recognition, recognize, you know, fight against fraud um, and uh, know your customer technologies are all coming to the fore. So that's, that's something else that we're planning on launching as part of um, our, our World Reg Tech Summit later this uh, year as part of FinTech Week. So that's a very brief introduction to Reg Tech. For those that know RegTech will know enough, um, but hopefully it was a good enough uh, introduction for those that don't. Um, and I most welcome questions. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Thank you Brian. And, and great to hear about some of the key elements that drive in that uh, secret sauce. And uh, I think the one that we're gonna come back to is, so is there an opportunity for Scottish firms to add some ingredients to that secret sauce and contribute and even make that secret sauce even more tasteful for the, the future markets. But anyway, let's, let's uh, come back to that in just a moment. So thank, thank you to Bertrand, Will, and uh, Brian there for their contributions. Hope that's set the tone. You've got the opportunity to ask sort of questions uh, in the Q&A box on the, the Zoom screen, uh, which we'll look out for. But I'm gonna try and hopefully now just draw, uh, draw out some of the particular areas for further consideration from uh, Will, sort of Bertrand, and Brian. And, um, I'm going to start off with a question just about more about the opportunities and really to, as much really personally I'm interested in hearing a lot about the, the Greater Bay Area um, and the opportunities, the innovation developments there, the opportunities for fintech and uh, I just wanted if say maybe Will first really whether you'd like to shed some light, what, what's actually, what, why is this being talked about, why is this a potential area for fintech enterprises? Um, well Stephen um, and, and Brian, you've really got yourself onto a source theme here. This GBA, Greater Bay Area topic uh, is hotter than um, Lao Gan Ma, which is the most hot, popular hot sauce in China, um, over one and a half million bottles coming out every day. So um, this is the place to pay attention. Um, so for those of you um, who aren't familiar with um, the geography of Hong Kong, um, the Greater Bay Area, or GBA, comprises um, nine cities um, in uh, the Pearl River Delta, as well as um, Hong Kong. Um, it's a problem with the sound. Um, around about uh, 70 million people 
um, GDP of 1.6 trillion US um, and about one fifth of um, China's um, high net worth households. Um, one of the most significant uh, plans announced for the GBA is this concept of, of uh, Wealth Connect, which has been successfully pioneered in, in the um, exchange markets by Hong Kong Exchange with uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai. Um, and what this will allow is really cross-border uh, two-way investment um, under which um, residents um, of the mainland um, in the cities I mentioned will be able to invest in eligible funds um, and investment products uh, distributed by banks in, in Hong Kong and Macau um, and vice versa for um, residents of Hong Kong um, and Macau to uh, invest in mainland products. Um, so um, really is quite transformational. Um, uh, why is this uh, relevant, worth mentioning today? Um, I and mean, I think per personally, the, um, it is transformational in that it provides um, access to mainland uh, China um, and controlled access uh, to the global markets uh, for wealth management products, very much with Hong Kong um, at its core um, as the point of interchange or, or access. Um, and sort of secondly, um, there are obviously a significant amount of, um, as Andrew's mentioned, of UK financial institutions with a presence here in Hong Kong, um, including a number of very important asset managers uh, from Scotland, uh, will have the opportunity to uh, sell funds and wealth management products um, via banks to the, world, to the mainland. Um, and so sort of lastly, with us on more of a fintech angle, um, there, are, there will be opportunities um, or are opportunities for uh, UK fintech companies to partner with financial institutions in China, um, again using Hong Kong as a, as, as a known base uh, to leverage uh, their global market position um, in financial technology um, as the, the Chinese uh, capital markets uh, further modernize and go global. So um, back to the, um, the hot source uh, analogy, this is certainly something to um, uh, pay attention to and uh, um, that, that's all from me on this point, uh, Stephen. Thanks, well, that's um, I, 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 it's building up my appetite actually uh, already. Um, Bertrand, do you, have you? Can I add to that a little bit, Stephen? Oh yes, yeah, so Yeah, you come in. Now. Yes, certainly. Yes, what's you know, when there are lots of chefs in the kitchen, one just has to step in, right? Yes, exactly. So, so just to add context to what William has been saying, so the population of Hong Kong is seven point four million, right? The population of Greater Bay Area is you multiply that by ten. Right. right, so 70 plus million. So suddenly the market size is just much larger, number one. Number two, for those that are less familiar with the, the, um, the geography, part of the positioning is that, you know, Hong Kong is to New York, right, and, and Shenzhen is to Silicon Valley, right? So Shenzhen is where a lot of the cutting edge companies, a lot of you would know, or me, the makers of a lot of the technologies that you know, whether it's from Tencent, um, or perhaps these days a little bit more controversially Huawei, right? But that's where, you know, that, that's, the, that's the center of, of a lot of innovation. And so um, that's the combination that as, as more investors and companies come here, that's the talent base that we hopefully get to tap as well. And these days, one of my roles is at the university too, at Hong Kong U, I lead Light Lab, so law, innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. So it is exactly tapping those skills in, in, in finance, and in business, but also in, in technology, that hopefully will be a great base for, for, for international investors and, and businesses. No, that's really interesting that the kind of sort of that coalescing of the forces. And I like your comparison there with New York and the US. We, we adopt a similar approach actually in Scotland, which is 5 million people, for the UK, which is 60. So, um, in the sort of, but I think there's obviously Hong Kong's very much recognized as a global fintech center. Virtual, what's your experience about where you? where you decided to um, set it up, which you did touch on in your presentation. Is there anything you want to build on, on this aspect? Well, coming back to what I've has just been said, you know, definitely, you know, the Greater Bay Area is an opportunity for many uh, startups or many companies. Um, for us, um, it's kind of different. Uh, we are in the payment industry. If we wanted to enter the China market in the payment industry, uh, basically, it's the same thing as, you know, entering the U.S. market. So the level of investment and connection that we will need is something that we don't have at this stage. That's why, as I mentioned briefly during the introduction, we decided to set up in Hong Kong. But our view and our objective is not to expand towards the Greater Bay, but to Southeast Asia. 
And then yeah, I would refer to another initiative, which is the uh, Red and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, that is also sponsored by the uh, uh, PRC government. And we can tell there is more and more uh, trade and business between China and Southeast Asia. And I will say that Hong Kong is at the center of it because uh, that's a trade center. So a lot of the companies that are, do business between, let's say, China and Thailand or where I am now, or uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, and so on, uh, they use an Hong Kong company to do that, especially for payment. And this, uh, that's the reason why, at the moment, we are looking at these markets. And also because these markets are smaller, uh, Thailand has a size of 70 million people, so you know uh, Vietnam is a bit is a bit bigger. Uh, but entering into each of this market needs to uh, set up a company there, needs to have a payment license. So as you can imagine, it's not something easy. But at least uh, the big players, that's not their focus today. So we consider that that give us uh, a good possibility to uh, to seize to size a, a momentum and to be among one of the first player in this, in this region and to build some kind of a regional you know, a payment, payment and FX platform between linking China, Hong Kong, and then Southeast Asia. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that's build on what you covered in your presentation about that entry point into a market, but then seeing really with that global dimension in a way that you start to develop and expand. Yeah, and also something that I can add is that we've been in business for a couple of months now, and yeah. uh, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, activity between, um, I, mean, I mean, companies set up in Hong Kong, but uh, um, receiving and making payment in Southeast Asia and, and China. And I think in addition to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, I think there is something that for sure will contribute to that trend is the, uh, the trade war with the US and the COVID-19 because I'm sh you know, everybody have heard of, I mean, we all, have, we all have heard about countries saying that they want to repatriate some industries in their own country, whether it is uh, in the UK, in the rest of the EU, in the US. So there is a need for the Chinese company to find other markets. And with Southeast Asia growing very quickly, very rapidly, uh, there is definitely a good market for Chinese companies there. Right, really interesting. So uh, could we just build on that a bit further? And so if you're a Scottish entrepreneur, an innovative firm, you see the opportunity in the Far East, but then you look at Hong Kong, you look at China, where it's really led from a digital technologies and innovation, not fintech and broader, really. So maybe we'll start with how would, what, how, how do you go about demonstrating your added value uh, in such a what could look like a huge market in bringing that through? Um, have you got any perspective on that? Um, yeah, um, just a couple of things. I mean, I think that um, you know, I think we all know that you know China, because of its sheer size, leads in payments and and, and many other areas of this uh, digital. Um, Revolution, but certainly from our perspective, um, we think that, uh, and this is that there, there are a number of other areas as well. Um, wealth management is is really uh, pretty underdeveloped. Um, the product set is pretty narrow, um, and and that's an area where you. UK, um, including Scotland, as I mentioned earlier, as, as a leading wealth international, uh, international wealth management system uh, uh, centre, clearly has some attractions um, from the Chinese uh, perspective in terms of uh, experience and learning from that, and also um, cooperation. So. Um, that I think is 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 one of the keys of, of any successful um, market entry strategy, um, as we found and friends of mine have found, is really to spend time um, really focusing and um, you know on the needs of financial institutions um, and their pain points before really contemplating um, solutions, um, because the. Um, the financial institution strategies um, have come from a very different starting point to what we used to in the West, um, where you've got, you know, decades or, or, or if not more um, of, um, you know, systems, um, legacy systems, um, whereas, the, you know, in many ways, the Chinese are starting stuff with a relatively clean sheet of paper. Um, so, uh, and the regulatory direction has also been been different. So I think that you know one has to really focus. Uh, cost is important, and, and obviously regulation increasingly important. But really on how one can help Chinese financial institutions uh, innovate or support that innovation. 
uh, which then will bring in you know a number of areas um including the ones you know brian's interested in from the reg tech perspective uh, wealth tech um, um insurance tech and how those they're built in from a microservice uh, perspective um so i think very very exciting but it's it's very that that uh, the, the key is to listen and understand uh, and then engage um, with Chinese counterparts. Um, there's a tendency in fintech for people to, to spray around their wares um, and, and not really understand what, what, what the buyer wants. But there is, I think, a win-win potential partnership. It's, it's an overused word out here in, in China. Um, if one does that, and some great opportunities to work, um, you know, between Scottish financial institutions and asset managers, the you know the Chinese banks with the new rules are, are dying out for innovative and asset management products. So, so very very exciting in, indeed, Stephen. Right, well, that's really, really, really focusing on that need. I love that word focus. I think about sometimes there's too much spray and pray approach. Brian, is that too true in finding the, the way into that regulatory opportunity and back to that secret sauce? Where there's so much happening, how, how best to navigate into that opportunity if you have a, an exciting proposition? So how I would think about it is this. So uh, let there be no uh, illusion. China is a tough market, right? So I actually helped set up Credit Suisse's uh, joint venture, you know, bank in China, right? So it's a tough market. But I think um, one of the things that countries like Scotland has is, is fantastic education fantastic universities and, and great ingenuity and, and innovation, right? So it's about innovation, um, you know, uh, and I think slightly to William's point, you, you know, if you try to solve every problem, you can't compete with Ali and Tencent, right? You know, they've got the huge infrastructure, they know the local market, but if there are specific innovations that you have and you drill down upon that uh, and, 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 and they're tested in other markets potentially. So for example, Again, the wonderful thing about Hong Kong is, is the, the common law, right? So, so and, and the thing about fintech, so when I was in, this is something I only understood only a few years after the fact. But so when I was in Silicon Valley, I was there during the dot-com boom and it was fantastic. But um, the big difference is, you know, with, um, with a dot-com, if there was a problem, they will say, oh, wait a minute, give me some time. Overnight, they'll just change the code and there we go, we solved it. But if you're a regulated company, you can't do that, right? You know, that doesn't work for the regulator. Um, and so um, coming from a jurisdiction like Scotland um, and being used to that regulatory environment and creating products around there that can then be transported uh, that solve real problems in markets you know, based in Hong Kong, going into China and Southeast Asia, as, as Bertrand has mentioned, I think that's where, um, dare I say it, um, smaller companies need to and can punch about their weight by being smart about how they focus their their their, um, their innovations rather than trying to spray and, and capture too much. So so I would recommend um, knowing what problem you're solving, focusing on that, um, gaining some traction in your home market, for example, in terms of uh, existing customer base as well as regulatory support, right? So that's where you mentioned the FCA. So the FCCA and the the British market and the Irish market, you know they they're trying to grow their homegrown fintechs and then expanding overseas. And I think, I believe that's something that Scotland can do a lot as well. Okay, so thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, Bertrand, just on that, in terms of obviously your early stage of your ed enterprise start for is really, how, how e it's easy to navigate and find those key areas of contacts in the Hong Kong market where you are really, because obviously time is, is money, really. Um, how, how, do you, how have you gone about that? No, there was no. It was not really difficult. This this part of the job was not uh, was not really difficult because uh, I mean Hong Kong. A lot of I mean everybody. Everyone knows everyone in Hong Kong. Okay, okay. so it's not like in China where you know I won't use this another overused term that is Quan Chi, uh, but uh, in Hong Kong it's much easier because you play by the rule. As long as you know the rule, then you know how to navigate. So. Uh, I must say, if I come back to what is our objective, it's much more difficult to uh, to navigate in other environment, typically in Thailand or tomorrow in Indonesia, where are the two other countries where we have most advanced contact. So I think for us, what is was is and is uh, was and is still uh, a difficulty is that um, 
again, speaking about the payment industry, whereas, um, you know, you have so many challenger banks and other payment platform in the UK and in Europe that uh, all companies and all individuals are getting used to that. Uh, it's still not the case in Hong Kong and in other part of Asia. So the most difficult part for us was and is still to uh, basically, um, you know, raise our uh, credibility so people will think okay I can work with that risk this guy is serious and they're not going to run away with our money right yes absolutely yeah got a follow-on question for Petron if I may yes uh, uh, Petron can you describe the current business climate in Hong Kong uh, and also explain how Statris is performing against its measures of success in the light of that um, to be honest, we had a difficult start because of the uh, because of the time we we launched our business. Uh, it has really the business has really picked up since uh, April, uh, up to a point that now we are ahead of budget. So that's um, so we are very happy with the situation in which we are now, uh, and. Again, we thought that there may be a drop in terms uh, of number of companies that will be set up in Hong Kong. That's not the case. And uh, I think that, um, I mean, Hong Kong has been, again, in the, the epicenter of, uh, you know, the Asia economy for uh, a couple of um, the last 30 years. I don't, I don't think that's, that this will change in, a, in any way. So it's very too many... Uh, Okay, Again, speaking about market, if you, if you are a company in Thailand, in, uh, in Vietnam, in Malaysia, and in most of other countries, then anyway, uh, you need to have also some kind of a sister company or a trading company to work with in Hong Kong because all of these countries that I mentioned, you know, have uh, foreign exchange control. So if you want to do business internationally, but each time you get paid, let's say in Thailand and Thai baht, and your Thai baht are immediately converted in uh, your, the US dollar you receive from your clients are immediately converted in Thai baht, then what do you do? That's why you need to have a company you deal with either in Hong Kong or in Singapore to basically grow your business internationally. And I won't go into many details unless you want to, but I think that Hong Kong has many more advantages than uh, Singapore in this respect. It's, key. it's easier to set up a company, it's less, it costs less to set up a company and so on. Thank you, Bertrand. Really. Could I just change tack really, just get your, each of your perspective around sort of the people aspect, because really to be successful, that recruitment of, of the team, the people. Um, maybe, Will, Will William, you're, you're, in terms of the team really, in terms of how, either how straightforward it been to bring in the right skills for FNZ within Hong Kong and China. Um, I mean, I think, Stephen, it's um, <clears throat> always an area of, of great challenge, but I think that, um, I mentioned earlier, we have our uh, Asian uh, Development Center in, in Shanghai, yeah. um, and, and we have, um, you know, similar positioning across, uh, across the world in terms of accessing, you know, first-class uh, engineers and resources. So um, that was certainly part of our thinking to um, achieve that objective as well as ensure, which is, you know, another key point um, is that, um, you know, one, one is um, kind of a, a adopts a mixture of, of globalization and localization. Yeah. Um, so at your core, you need to be global in your approach and your approach to meeting global standards, but at the same time need to be very focused on, 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 on cultures as well as ensuring that product uh, meets the needs of the marketplace. Um, so I think that's really where we, we pride ourselves. I mean, in terms of, I mean, it's, a, it, it's said by many companies, but, but in the culture we, we have of, of many different nationalities and that's across the globe and really blending the two, I think, makes one um, unique um, and uniquely positioned to take advantage of um, you know this massive growth opportunity in, in, in wealth and, and, and other areas in in Asia so yeah, I don't whether that answers your question but it does yeah I think it's a good point about the blend really getting that blend the yeah. culture aspect I mean better I think you've got 20 people at the moment that start for us really is there any particular point is in the team that you've you've brought in there for the for the enterprise 
So can you repeat? I didn't hear. In, in terms okay. of your recruitment of people as part of the team, is it uh, people you've brought into Hong Kong or is it people you've recruited locally? Um, let me think of it. No, most of the people, I would say 80% of the people that were recruited were in Hong Kong already. So they are not, uh, all of them are not necessarily uh, Hong Kongese, but they were all living in Hong Kong for a while. Um, so... And, you know, and that's also another good reason why we decided, you know, to set up in Hong Kong, because there is a huge pool of talents in Hong Kong, okay. especially because uh, I think it's Andrew who mentioned at the beginning of this uh, webinar that there are more than 200 banks in Hong Kong. So uh, that includes a lot of, uh, you know, IT people working for this bank. So for us, that, that was a good, uh, a good pool to, uh, to find the, the people that we needed to develop our payment platform. Yeah, right. Okay. And Brian, you'll, you'll see a whole range of firms. Do you see an interest among sort of people from Hong Kong really interested in working for international firms that come into the region? Um, Is that very much from a so. career point of view? Very much so. I, I think, you know, especially these days when I spend more time with younger people, right, being at, at the university and the like, um, uh, Hong Kong has always been very cosmopolitan. Right, every since its modern birth, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, um, I think that people are always keen and happy to work where there are good opportunities. There are opportunities to learn, there are opportunities to grow, uh, and, and the like. And, and so um, uh, that you know, the, those opportunities are always welcome. The interesting thing now with my being more in the, the, eco, the, the startup entrepreneurship in, in ecosystem is that these companies are smaller. Right, so 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 now, um, and uh, there's the there's a maxim about how um, uh, you know the, the, the biggest um, challenge of getting a young person to join a startup is his or her mother, right? They're like, no, 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 don't join a startup, right? You know, <laughs> um, what do I explain to auntie, right? But yeah. you know, increasingly with fintech growing and the like, I mean, some of the biggest um, hires in the last year or so have been the virtual banks. They're setting up brand new banks, full functionality, right, right across the board. Um, eight of them for Hong Kong, InsurTex, three of them, right? Um, digital asset uh, platforms, um, you know, otherwise known as crypto uh, exchanges, but yeah. legalized and, 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 you know, with licenses. One has one with, um, um, uh, uh, has a license in, in principle and the others are in the play. So there are lots of different, um, uh, opportunities uh, we have, especially in payments, so many wonderful entrepreneurs, not from Hong Kong, but coming here, setting up here for a lot of reasons, as mentioned. So um, I think that that very much uh, young people are always looking at opportunities. Um, these are actually tougher times, right, with COVID and the like. And so any opportunity that's growing and have opportunity to learn um, and people are reskilling as well. Um, the, the, uh, be, uh, it doesn't matter where you come from, um, that would be most welcome. Well, yeah, great, right. Right, time's really ticked on. I was just gonna ask each of you just, you know, in terms of the, for the audience, particularly those firms in Scotland and, and in the UK, really, in terms of, well, if there's one particular thing you ask, suggest they keep in mind what that would be as they look to say, come to Hong Kong and start to grow, go more global. Um, maybe, Will, if we start with you, what would be the, the one sort of key thing you'd highlight? I think, Will, you aren't silent. You're on. Uh, sorry, the, there's been a lot of coverage of, of um, the events in Hong Kong in the last year and obviously the broader effects of, of COVID on the, on the local economy. But I think that the thing I would really hammer home is that um, Hong Kong continues to have, um, you know, the markets have been extremely resilient here. The financial sector remains highly resilient. Um, and that's because, you know, Hong Kong has a real role um, in the connector or glue between international investors and, and with the UK, I think, in fintech, there's a natural uh, access there. Um, and the free capital movement and transparency and rule of law um, governing commercial transactions uh, continue. So Hong Kong, you know, if you want an Asian base and particularly want to play in, um, in, in greater China, um, Hong Kong is definitely the home for you. Um, it's a great place to establish partnerships. Um, and, and that's why we're really leading our greater China expansion um, plans for, for FNZ um, from here. 
Um, and of course, you know, that's even those things are without, as we, we've discovered today, um, our hot source uh, in the Greater Bay Area. So uh, that, that's an added benefit. And it's a, it's a once in a lifetime um, opportunity, I think, to break into China. Great, great point. Bertrand, last or final point you hammer home? No, I fully agree with what William has said. And uh, I think Hong Kong is a good, um, you know, it's a good entry point if you want to uh, start your operation in Asia. Uh, it's very cosmopolitan, so it gives you a flavor of what can be Asia. Um, and also, it's kind of easy to uh, set up your operation here. You have uh, good uh, access to talent. So there are many good reasons. One, you know, if I want to answer to that question in a way that is very down to earth, I think that I will say that uh, in the past, you know, the one inconvenience of Hong Kong was the, the cost of, uh, you know, renting an office because everything was, you know, everything related to properties in Hong Kong has always been very expensive. And I must say that recently because of COVID-19, uh, the price have dropped down. So uh, recently we've managed to move to a new office uh, saving almost 50% uh, of our rental price. So for a young company with us, that's even a, you know, a good thing. <laughs> right. that's, a, that's a really interesting uh, lesson there. Uh, and Brian, so finally, what would be the, the message you'd want to hammer home, particularly on this secret sauce? Well, if, if we're going to go cooking together, um, <laughs> I think uh, it, it's that if, if your audience and is interested in fintech, um, it doesn't matter what kind of fintech. Um, Hong Kong is actually promoting it greatly as is, are its regulators. And in fact, regardless of the category of fintech, you know, reg tech can actually serve all of those um, segments. And, and the regulators are very supportive. Um, the, the Hong Kong Inc. parties like Invest Hong Kong are very supportive. As was mentioned by Bertrand, now, you know, co-working spaces, well, Social distancing has created some issues there, but there, there are lots of facilities that are available that can address some of those aspects of, um, of space. So um, I think, uh, you know, especially, I, I, I'd again welcome those that are interested in FinTech, regardless of its color, um, but specifically RegTech to come to Hong Kong because that's where a lot of the financial uh, institutions are as well. Great, thank you. Well, for me, it's been a real privilege to be in the kitchen with three terrific uh, world-leading chefs. Um, Will from uh, FNZ, uh, Bertrand from Stutteris, and uh, of course, Brian from the Hong Kong FinTech Association. I've learned as a trainee. I'm, I'm not there to be a chef yet, but it's great hearing those insights. And I know it'd be a real interest to a number of the enterprises in Scotland and, and wider. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over now to Keith uh, for some closing words. Over to you, Keith. Uh, I've, I've got the difficult task of summing up from uh, what has been a, uh, you know, a really good discussion. I'll just try and highlight uh, you know, a, you know, a handful of points. Uh, uh, we heard that uh, you know, in Hong Kong, there is a large unmet need for banking solutions aimed at small, medium-sized enterprises. I think that point came through uh, fairly strongly. Um, we, we also heard about the, uh, the ease of doing business in Hong Kong uh, and, and the ease of setting up uh, you know, businesses in, you know, in Hong Kong for uh, entrepreneurs that, are, uh, that don't reside in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, we, we, we also heard about Hong Kong as a key nexus for companies trading across uh, Southeast uh, Asia. I think that point came through uh, fairly strongly. Uh, there was a desire by regulators in Hong Kong to improve the uh, adoption of uh, reg tech solutions. And I think Brian uh, was at pains to explain how reg tech is a secret source. I think that is the key buzzword uh, of this webinar. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, we, uh, from William, I think uh, he underscored, I think, the, the uh, unmatched opportunity for uh, wealth management uh, solutions in Hong Kong, and the opportunity for fintechs to partner with financial uh, institutions in Hong Kong to sell uh, across China. Um, um, we, we also heard that uh, uh, Hong Kong is at the center of businesses. Uh, 
or rather it's at the center of business between China and Southeast Asia. And Hong Kong's position is unlikely to change uh, in, the, you know, in the medium term. Uh, so for those not familiar with uh, Invest Hong Kong, we are, the, um, we are effectively the uh, inward uh, investment uh, promotion agency of the uh, government of Hong Kong. And I lead uh, their fintech uh, support uh, uh, based here you know, in London. And my job is to help European fintechs to plot uh, a pathway into, into Asia via uh, yeah, you know, a base in Hong Kong. Uh, our services are free, uh, customized, and confidential. Uh, we operate through uh, colleagues that are based uh, in, in the US uh, and a core team that is based in Hong Kong. Uh, and at the center, I think, of our efforts to highlight Hong Kong's position as a key fintech hub is Hong Kong Fintech Week. Um, Stephanie, can we... Uh, um, I mean, as you can see from this slide, Hong Kong is, uh, is a vibrant fintech ecosystem. I think we see uh, over 600 fintech companies. Uh, a large number of those companies have been set up by entrepreneurs uh, from outside. Uh, Stephanie, can you... Uh, and, you know, at this difficult time when, uh, you know, VCs are struggling to write a check, uh, you know, on the basis that companies are going to raise a, a larger round uh, in the near term, uh, I think uh, a lot of entrepreneurs would welcome access to soft funding. There is a lot of good funding uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, if, if I just maybe highlight the technology voucher scheme, which offers, uh, you know, close to £60,000, uh, to help uh, SMEs to procure um, uh, technology solutions from, uh, you know, from tech companies. And that, that maybe speaking to uh, Bertrand's point about the, the large admit need for banking solutions in Hong Kong, I think the technology voucher can, can serve uh, a purpose in, uh, you know, in supporting uh, you know, adoption uh, of uh, solutions in Hong Kong. Stephanie, can we move on? The, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ecosystem in Hong Kong is, is uh, well supported by, by uh, government funded incubation schemes. And, and the, the two foremost incubation schemes are uh, uh, led by uh, Cyberport and Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Uh, they offer uh, access to sources of capital. Uh, they offer highly subsidized um, 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 you know, commercial premises, and, and they also offer um, it, you know, government funding. Can you uh, proceed to the next slide, please? So, so the highlight, I think, of you know, our FinTech calendar uh, in Hong Kong is uh, you know, Hong Kong FinTech Week. Uh, it's, it's been running for the past uh, four years, uh, you know, I think. And I think last year we had over 12,000 attendees. Uh, unfortunately, in response to COVID, this year's event is going to be uh, you know, a virtual event. Uh, you could argue that uh, uh, you know, it's a plus uh, you know, for us in the sense that we'll be able to reach uh, more companies. Uh, it's the, uh, the enterprise is quite nominal, I would say, you know, it's about, you know, less than, you know, hundred uh, US dollars. Um, so for anyone looking to understand uh, how to benefit from the event, I'll be more than happy to, you know, to have a conversation with you uh, privately. So my details, uh, once again, I am the senior FinTech manager at Invest Hong Kong. I'm based in our London office, and I work very closely with uh, my colleagues that are based in Hong Kong, and uh, two colleagues that are based in San Francisco, and one in uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, so that's it for me. Um, and uh, once again, thank you to uh, Stephen for a fantastic discussion, and thank you for colleagues uh, in Hong Kong for their support. Thank you.
So I think we move on, Stephen, to question and answers. There is. So I thought that we closed there. We finished. No, I think I think now is Q and A. Oh, sorry. I was yeah. told we we're finished at eleven. So. Oh. I I think we just done Q and A, haven't we? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Stephen. I think we will wrap it up here. And thank you, everyone, for attending. It's been a very informative session. So thank you very much from Invest Hong Kong and all our colleagues from Scotland as well. Thank you, Andrew. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks thank you. for having us. Thank you. Thank you.